Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, it looks like uh, quite a few people are in now, so we'll go ahead and get started. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr, and I am the Chief Knowledge Broker for OCTO, stand, stands for Open Communications for the Ocean, and um, we're really glad you could be with us today. Um, and I'm very pleased to introduce Jeff Young, who's the Senior Manager of Global Capacity Development at EDF. Um, and join, he's going to be presenting today on a new toolkit for building climate resilient fisheries. But I'd also like to welcome his colleague, Sarah Poon, the Associate Vice President uh, for the Fisheries Solutions Center at EDF. Um, and she'll be helping post information in the chat and the Q&A at times. Um, so thank you both, Jeff and Sarah, for being here. Um, before we get started, I wanted to let everyone know we'll use our, our usual format. We'll have Jeff presenting, and then we will uh, have time for Q&A at the end. But we welcome you and encourage you to send in questions as you think of them. You can put you can post them either in the Q&A or in the chat, um, either one works. Um, and then with the chat, it is also enabled so that you can uh, chat with other attendees if you desire. You can send things just to Jeff and Sarah and I, or you can send it to all attendees. We just ask that if you are using the chat to send things to all attendees or us, that you use it professionally and respectfully. Um, so again, thank you for being here, Jeff and Sarah. Jeff, I'll turn it over to you now. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And hi, everybody. Welcome. It's such a pleasure to be joining you all today. And again, I wanted to thank Sarah and Octo for the opportunity to share with the Octo community. And I also want to take a moment, thank each and every one of you who is joining today for carving some time out in your day to tune in and allow us this opportunity to share. My name is Jeff Young. And I am the Senior Manager of Global Capacity Development at an Environmental Defense Fund. I'm here today representing my team, the Fisheries Solutions Center. We are a team of interdisciplinary experts who work closely with local partners around the world to provide fishery science and policy advice, engage diverse stakeholders, develop innovative tools, and deliver trainings to help fishing communities build a better future. I'm here today to share about our new Climate Resilient Fisheries Toolkit, which helps fisheries practitioners and communities around the world tackle the most pressing challenges facing their fisheries. Today, I'll be able to share for about 30-ish minutes, and we'll utilize the rest of the time for questions and discussions. My colleague, Sarah Poon, is also joining and may help along the way by posting links in the chat and maybe responding to small questions along the way. We look forward to interacting with you and thank you again for joining us today. So I'd love to begin by sharing a story about the blue swimming crab fishery in Indonesia, a fishery that I've been able to work closely with over the course of several years. Blue swimming crab is the third most valuable export fishery in Indonesia. And beyond it being a valuable fishery, I want to take us to the people. Uh, the, this fishery supports the livelihoods of over 90,000 fishers across the country and 185,000 female fish workers. Despite the fishery's significance for jobs and livelihood, the fishery has been faced with historical overfishing. Folks have to fish farther from shore to catch the same amount of crabs. Crabs they're catching are smaller, the profits they're getting for these crabs have decreased, and as a result, the communities that are dependent on this fishery for their livelihood are very, very vulnerable. I now want to take us to Lampung province, which is located in South Sumatra in Indonesia. 
In Lampung province, there are many fishers at home uh, from crabs, blue swing crab. And these fishers account for about 10% of national blue swimming crab production. We've had the opportunity and privilege to work with local partners in Lampung province to understand their challenges and support them in finding a path forward for the fishery. For example, the national level trawl ban and national level size limit both saw very limited enforcement and did not do much to prevent the fishery from continuing to decline. In addition, across the country and including in Lampung, data was very limited on the fishery and this precluded finer scale management. Local fisheries managers and practitioners did not know how to proceed to build a better future. There are also perverse incentives throughout the fishery with buyers and industry commonly buying undersized crabs, which did not help with the implementation of the size limit, and fishermen kept continuing to catch them. So fishers, local crab processors and buyers, local managers alike were all concerned about the future of the fishery and were struggling to find a path forward. However, there was a willingness to seek a path forward to implement precautionary adaptive management to ensure a better future for the fishery and local fishing communities. But the question was, how, how do we do this? How do we bring people together? Where do we begin? How do we align? Um, what are, where should we be focusing our efforts? Over the course of over two years, we were able to work with local NGOs such as Starling Resources, Coral Triangle Center, local community groups, provincial and municipal officials, government scientists, local university representatives, and participants and community members from four different fishing villages to design an adaptive fishery management process and plan for blue swimming crab. To do this, we are able to utilize one of our tools, um, Fishy, or the Framework for Integrated Stock and Habitat Evaluation to serve as a guide for a process that local stakeholders were able to adopt and implement to give them a roadmap for integrating existing information about the fishery, building in and supporting participatory decision-making, and providing guidance on what future data to prioritize for collection. This also included processes to engage communities and local stakeholders to set common fishery goals, select indicators to measure these goals, and then define harvest control rules in accordance with these goals to set the foundation for adaptive management. Over the course of two years, local stakeholders worked to develop a science-based adaptive fisheries management plan which now includes no fishing zones to protect juveniles, a smaller size limit with stronger enforcement, so smaller than the national standard to ensure the health of the local stock, as well as buy-in from industry representatives to not no longer purchase undersized crabs, uh, in addition to various habitat protections, such as banning of local sand mining as well as establishment of a new data collection program to inform adaptive management moving forward. Overall, the tool that we were able to utilize and adapt in the local context where it was able to bring stakeholders together to understand each other's perspectives and needs and take action to work toward shared goals and visions for the future. Our work is not done, and the work is not done here in Lampung, but again, the foundation and infrastructure for adaptive management has been established, including a self-running multi-stakeholder management committee, uh, which is now serving as a model for other blue swimming crab fisheries in other parts of Indonesia and management at regional scales. Um, this also serves as a foundation uh, and uh, builds and has generated interest in exploring further how climate change might affect this species and others that are caught by local fishers, as well as opportunities to continue building resilience at a wider level, both on land and in the water. 
I wanted to start with a story to provide context, as over the last decade, we've worked with many partners and communities around the world, just like the folks I described in Lampoon about in Lampoon, Indonesia, to tackle the big questions they face in management. Along the way, we've worked to integrate the best available science and research from the field, as well as working with local partners to capture their experiences and community perspectives and knowledge into more than 30 practical tools that are now housed in our Climate Resilient Fisheries Toolkit. So in a way, the tools and products on our tool, in our toolkit represent a culmination of all these various experiences that we've been privileged to be a part of around the world. These user-friendly products serve as a bridge between the cutting edge research and approaches um, with many contributions from experts who are joining this call today and a part of the Octo community and local knowledge and experiences to support on the ground action around the world. And again, we've captured these experiences and this knowledge and we are making them available and replicable to communities and practitioners around the world through our Climate Resilient Fisheries Toolkit. So what, what is in the toolkit? We'll later do a live demo, demo but I'll continue to provide an overview through the PowerPoint presentation for now. On the toolkit website, you'll find participatory and innovative tools that can help you assess conditions and prioritize interventions within a community or a region. Analytical tools that can help you explore things like governance gaps, climate impacts, ecosystem threats, and food and nutrition security needs. We also have a set of decision-making frameworks. So the example from Lampung with Fishy is an example of one to help folks integrate available data and knowledge into management action. We also have a host of manuals and guides to support the design and implementation of fishery solutions. And we also have a host of inspirational stories and case studies that highlight the experiences from around the world to show what's been done and to provide inspiration and uh, great examples of what could be done uh, in any given place. In addition, we have resources that can help build foundational knowledge. So we have a set of immersive e-courses on fisheries topics, and foundations for building climate resilient fisheries. Finally, we have a, a repository of additional learning resources that include reports, white papers, webinars, and infographics related to fisheries management and climate resilient topics. I do wanna highlight that the tools and resources in the toolkit are intended, again, to help advance fisheries along five key pathways for climate resilience. The first is to ensure effective fisheries management and governance is in place. Uh, as many of you know, very little can be done to address climate change effects without fundamental best practices for fisheries management, such as participatory decision-making, secure fishing rights that incentivize stewardship, science-based limits on fishing mortality, and mechanisms to serve, ensure accountability. So we have a host of tools that help people address this particular pathway. The second is to anticipate and plan for future change. So this is about understanding how climate change will impact fisheries in the future and now, and ensuring that our management and governance systems are ready for those changes. Um, very shortly, I will dive into an example of a tool that helps one anticipate and plan for future change. The third pathway is enhancing cooperation, especially across international boundaries, but it could be local boundaries as well within, within a country. Uh, this is because, as you all know, fish stocks do not know borders, and fish stocks with climate change are increasingly changing into their distribution patterns and 
the geographic scale of fisheries management must therefore change and be flexible in order to manage stocks sustainably across shifting ranges. This in turn will require greater degrees of interjurisdictional cooperation and flexibility. And so we do have some resources that are intended to help folks think about this particular question of appropriately scaling management. The fourth is to build ecosystem resilience to help respond to the unknown. So this means taking what steps we can to ensure we create healthy and biodiverse ecosystems that are better equipped to withstand future climate impacts. Uh, when I think about this, I think about humans and when we get a cold, we want to make sure we're strong and healthy so that we can withstand um, exposure to, to viruses and things like that better. And finally, the fifth pathway is to ensure principles of fairness and equity drive policy decisions. Truly effective fisheries management requires equitable, equitable participation and can be undermined by social conflict arising, arising from inequitable processes or outcomes. Um, this is why it's very important that our tools are designed in a way that help promote and support and encourage participation. And again, many of the tools in our toolkit all serve one or more of these five principles. And you can think about these principles as the outcomes or change uh, that we want to see uh, in the world of fisheries in achieving climate resilience, both on land and in the water. So next, I wanted to take us to explore an example of a tool. So what is a tool and what can it help one answer? And how would you go about using a tool? I'd like to present the example of our, one of our tools, a climate vul vulnerability assessment. So say you and the community are interested in learning more about what species that is caught by the fishery are going to be most at risk due to climate change. Being able to answer this question can help you and the community prioritize species for management and perhaps even develop diversification strategies for the long term. If you, for example, know that a species of high commercial importance um, may be severely threatened by climate change. So to apply this tool, you can access the climate vulnerability assessment tool online, which I'll guide us to in a moment. Um, and then you can download it. It is an Excel file, and you'll be able to conduct a participatory process, which you will look at several things. Uh, number one, you will work with the community to find what species are commonly found uh, in the fishery, what, fish what species are commonly caught, um, which species are of most importance of interest, uh, as well as understanding the relationship of these species with the local community. Are certain species important for um, the culture or certain species important for consumption, things like that. Uh, then the CVA tool will combine two elements. Uh, number one, the exposure of a species to climate change um, with its sensitivity to stressors to estimate an overall climate vulnerability score. Um, so you would be able to then, based on the species that you have identified with the community, um, be able to reference literature to better understand, OK, in this place or region, what are the climate threats? Um, what is the projected magnitude of change in physical climate variables? Um, this could be things like temperature, salinity, storm intensity, pH. Uh, things that are going to impact this area and impact the species found in this area. Uh, then there is the ability to, for each species, um, explore sensitivity. So looking at the biological traits of each species, things like adult mobility, diet preferences, spawning cycles, uh, habitat suitability, uh, that will determine how it will respond to climate change. As both of these elements are examined, 
there is the opportunity to do some literature review, but most importantly, the opportunity to have discussions with the community, with local stakeholders, to get an understanding of what they're seeing, um, what what do they know, what have they had, what have they perceived, what have they observed, um, how is temperature changing, how has storm intensity changed over time, um, the in regards to the biological traits of a species, uh, corroborating whether or not the um, information that has been gleaned from literature is actually reflected uh, on the water based on their experiences, and by Combining these two um, assessments of exposure and sensitivity, scores can be assigned in terms of relative exposure risk, relative ex sensitivity risk, uh, and then a vulnerability score could be generated for each species, which would help us understand the relative probability of each species experiencing adverse outcomes things like declines in productivity or declines in abundance as a result of climate change. So again, there's an opportunity to answer the key question of what species will be most impacted by climate change and the opportunity to gather and invite participation from local stakeholders really tap into their local knowledge, which is often very, very rich and very, very deep, to inform the answer of which species might be most vulnerable to climate change. Uh, by utilizing the best available information and knowledge, both from literature and from local experts, uh, we create the space for discussion and dialogue on what's going on, um, we build relationships with different stakeholders, and ultimately we're able to come to a consensus on how we might prioritize species for management and what we might do to mitigate risk in the face of climate change. You'll see that tools on our site are intended to help stakeholders answer specific questions that come up in their journey to build climate resilient fisheries. And all of our tools, like the climate vulnerability assessment tool that I just touched upon, again, are designed to be participatory, integrated in combination of readily available information from online literature, but also highly leveraging local knowledge and expertise, uh, integrating traditional forms of knowledge to help us turn um, to synthesize and collect this information and help us answer questions that we encounter on our journey to build resilient fisheries. Um, as I just mentioned, with the climate vulnerability assessment, uh, that tool is an Excel-based tool, um, but a lot of the dialogue and discussion can occur outside of Excel. Uh, it just takes one person to be able to gather that information, input it into Excel, and then generate the output that can be shared um, for discussion and dialogue with local stakeholders. Um, here are just some examples of some other select tools that, again, demonstrate what our toolkit does. Um, it helps us answer very specific questions related to fisheries management. Um, so, so, for example, maybe someone is interested in um, working in a fishery and designing interventions, and the first step is trying to get an understanding of all the different players, the major institutions, the entities, and getting an understanding of their influence and interest in improving fisheries management. And for this, we have a fisheries systems mapping tool that would allow you to map out the different players, their relationships, the power dynamics, uh, opportunities for engagement and leverage. Say, for example, you are interested in understanding where there are policy and governance gaps. Uh, as we as we know, um, strong governance is often a really great or, or it's very foundational for management to even occur. And so we have a tool that, again, invites you to um, conduct literature review, uh, consult local experts, consult community members uh, to evaluate the efficacy, strengths and weaknesses of fisheries policy and the government system. And the output of the tool would be 
uh, priority areas to address and additional um, generation of recommendations of what could be done to improve fisheries policy and governance. Uh, I do want to bring our attention to one of our newer tools uh, called NutriCast. Uh, and so unlike the Excel-based tools I just mentioned, this one is actually a web-based tool that is highly interactive uh, that we have developed in partnership with the Chan School of Public Health at Harvard and the M-Lab at UCSB. And this tool helps us better understand uh, the intersection of seafood and food security in a given region, and particularly how this relationship might change due to climate change and how different management interventions can result in different outcomes. And uh, this tool is um, pretty cool to check out. Um, Sarah might be able to share a link in the chat, uh, or we can share the link later. Um, but this tool I wanted to spotlight in highlighting our uh, toolkits expansion to think and work more holistically, to more explicitly link management actions in the water to serving livelihood and well-being considerations on land. And also demonstrating that we have web-based tools as well, in addition to Excel-based tools that can be downloaded and used offline. So now that you've gotten a little bit of background, I'll invite us all to go check out the toolkit website and I will I will guide us. So here we have websites and uh, Sarah can share a link to our website uh, in the chat and it'll also be available um, uh, on the last slide. And, uh, but yeah, now that you've gotten a little bit of background, here's our, our website. And I just wanted to kind of spotlight some of the different things I touched upon during the presentation to give you a little bit more orientation. Uh, so here we have our home page, which provides a high level snapshot of our website's offerings, our tools, stories, uh, the pathways that I described, uh, a link to our e-courses. And I wanted to orient us to the different um, categories or high level navigation tabs. Um, so here we have the first column, build knowledge. And this is intended to help folks build foundational knowledge around climate resilient fisheries, fisheries management. Um, so we have a page here about where you can learn more about the five different climate resilient fisheries pathways I just described. In addition, we have a lot of research, resources, literature, case studies related to secure fishing rights programs. So there is a whole set of pages where one can learn a little bit more and build knowledge about secure fishing rights and ensuring that incentives aligned are aligned in fisheries management. We also have our virtual fisheries academy, which I will actually take us to, which is our online set of e-courses that can help you build foundational knowledge uh, in fisheries management topics, um, climate resilient fisheries, data limited fisheries management. Um, these courses are all free and can be accessed anytime, anywhere for no costs. And they're available in a host of different languages. And we're, we're looking to translate more of them uh, in the future. Um, these are really, really great resources. And we've received really, really um, good feedback from partners and them being valuable and training up new staff and partners and um, promoting level setting. Under build knowledge, again, there's uh, pages for additional learning resources. So this is going to be additional white papers and reports and literature that folks can reference. Now, say you are a practitioner and you're looking to take action. So you're beyond building knowledge and you're ready to take some action you're grappling with some sort of management challenge or question and, and you need to find a path forward. Uh, this is where you would go to explore our tools. And I wanted to highlight that we have organized our tools in two different ways. Um, the first is to explore tools by different thematic areas. So essentially we have a big inventory of tools and products over 30. Um, but this is a way to help the user more uh, elegantly find what they're looking for. 
Um, the first way of organizing the tools and accessing the tools is by thematic area. Um, so here we have six different thematic areas. Um, under governance and policy, you would find tools related to assessing the governance system and um, assessing policy. So the fisheries governance and policy analysis tool that I mentioned earlier would be would pop up if you clicked here. Here we have climate adaptive management. So tools to support adaptive management and in the context of, of climate change. And um, if you clicked on this, you would find the fishy tool that I described from the Indonesia example. We have another thematic area called livelihoods and well-being. So this is um, housing examples and tools and products that do really deal with people and communities uh, on land. And uh, if you clicked here, uh, you would find the NutriCast uh, tool pop up and that it's supporting the well-being and nutrition of, of people. Uh, and then we have science and data. So anything related to stock assessment, data limited fisheries management, data collection, uh, you would find under science and data. We have here secure fishing rights. So resources and tools related to designing secure fishing rights systems, uh, evaluating uh, attributes, whether or not they're present, attributes of secure fishing rights, um, you would find that here, in addition to uh, the manuals and guides that EDF has produced uh, around designing turf systems, cooperative systems, quota-based systems. Uh, and finally, we have a thematic area called ocean technology solutions. So uh, here at EDF, we have increasingly worked at the intersection of technology and fisheries management. Uh, exploring how different technologies could support or enhance um, fisheries management uh, implementation, data collection, enforcement, and other applications. And so here is where you'd find tools and resources and examples uh, related to the application of technology in fisheries management. I also wanted to direct us to project phases as another way of orienting um, ourselves to the tools and accessing the tools. So this is more around a uh, generalized phase and we've organized the tools in this way as well. Oh, sorry. We've organized this uh, the tools in this way as well, because it follows the process that maybe some practitioners or organizations or governance governments pursue fishery reforms. And so in the strategic scoping phase, which is the first one, uh, this is where fishery practitioners might be exploring challenges, opportunities, and goals within a region and uh, developing a strategy for gauging with a fishery system. Sorry, this keeps changing, apologies. Um, second, um, folks might be going undergoing a site selection phase in which they're selecting the most strategically appropriate sites for fisheries to work. Uh, in the assessment engagement phase, this is basically where you've already decided um, where it might, one might want to work. And so this is where practitioners would conduct a deeper analysis of conditions, engage with fishery stakeholders and collect information. So under each of these different project phases, again, we have a host of tools that can help serve you in this phase. Um, next, you would have the design phase. And this is actually where you're working with local stakeholders to uh, make decisions, design management, and um, create management plans. So again, a lot of resources, guides, manuals uh, to, to help support this process. Um, naturally, you would have then the implementation phase. Uh, this is where the management plan goes live on the water and requires gathering people, um, administration, uh, collecting of data, monitoring enforcement. And again, we have a lot of resources to support this phase and uh, a lot of the technology resources I mentioned will occur in this phase. And finally, evaluation. So being able to assess and understand how the system is performing, um, what opportunities there are for improvement and adaptation moving forward.
I'll next take us to uh, finding inspiration. So this is a really great opportunity to learn about what others are doing. Um, this could be to um, for a practitioner or user where uh, they don't know how a tool could serve them. Um, here we provide case studies and how different communities have applied tools in the past. Um, and this is also a really great opportunity for uh, us to elevate the voices and stories and experiences of the partners and communities on the ground. Uh, each of these stories is written uh, by uh, and in the voice of the community member uh, and really elevating their experience, what challenge they faced, um, what tool they are able to apply, what their process and experience was like, and what the outcome was in um, their journey to build a resilient fishery. Uh, this is probably my favorite part of the website, and we are looking to build out more stories uh, into the future. And perhaps some of you on the call may work with local partners to apply a tool in the future, and we would love to hear your story and elevate your voice and the voice of your partners on our website as well. And so we have finally the fourth tab, uh, a form where you can contact us to share your story or provide your feedback. With that, I'll take us back to the slides here and uh, a link to access the Climate Resilient Fisheries Toolkit is provided on this slide. And I imagine Sarah has also pasted it on the chat. And I just wanted to close by sharing a couple things. Um, one is a reflection, um, an invitation, and two is a short update and announcement. Um, I'll start with the announcement actually. So uh, I wanted to say that this toolkit is a living product and we will continue to add and update new tools uh, based on the challenges that you and others are facing in the world. And for example, we do have a new tool that will be coming out in January. Uh, it is called the Climate Resilient Fisheries Planning Tool. Uh, it is a very comprehensive tool that helps uh, evaluate the resilience of the broader fishery system. Um, so thinking very holistically, thinking about the people on land, uh, the resource, resource management, and the institutions that are involved in ensuring the sustainability of the resource and the well-being of folks. Um, and I think this is important because climate change will continue to bring increasing complexities, and therefore we need to start thinking about building resilience um, not only in the water, but on the land, um, thinking about the social ecological system. And this analysis will help local stakeholders develop strategies to enhance resilience and prepare for climate stressors and their impacts. And is based off um, the emerging and growing climate broader thinking related around um, climate resilience. And so I'll invite people to stay tuned. Um, maybe there can be an opportunity for my colleagues and our partners uh, who are part of the SNAP working group um, who are working on this tool to share at uh, a future Octo webinar. Uh, so that was the announcement. And then I'll close with um, some reflections and an invitation. So again, the toolkit is a living product um, meant to serve you, meant to serve folks around the world and comes really from our experiences, but um, we want to grow the toolkit. Um, we want it to reflect you as well. So we'd love to hear from you and invite you to be in touch. Um, we invite you to use our tools, get, provide us feedback, uh, let us know what things you're, what challenges you're grappling with, um, what needs you, you need or partners need. Um, we also invite you to share your story with us. So if you have used one of our tools in our past, in the past, or will be using a tool in the past, please, please be in touch. Um, we see this toolkit as an opportunity and platform for partnership, collaboration, um, much like Sarah and Akko have done with the Octo community. We look forward to continuing to serve and work with you to build a better future that builds resilience, both in the water and in our coastal communities. Uh, that's why I really love being part of the Octo community and engaging with you all. 
uh, who are here because we're really um, all working towards the same vision, the same goal of bettering uh, resilience, bettering, uh, building a better future for coastal communities around the world. Uh, so thank you again for joining today. And I'll invite you to visit the toolkit at fisherysolutioncenter.org.edf.org. And we can transition now to some discussion and Q&A. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we really appreciate your, this really, really clear and informative presentation. Um, so I just got to remind everyone, you can send in questions either through the Q&A uh, panel or the chat. Um, we have a couple of questions right now. Uh, one that was, I work primarily in the area of anadromous species, and I'm looking for more resources for the brackish freshwater reaches of the fishery and climate change impacts in these areas. After a brief search on the site, I only see one or two resources in this area. Are there any plans in the works to expand this? Yeah, that is a really, really great question, and uh, I'm not sure who asked the question, um, but I left my email on the last slide. It's uh, jyoung at edf.org, and would definitely love to discuss more on um, what particular um, questions you're trying to tackle related to amandrous fisheries and um, if there might be opportunity for us to help curate existing resources or literature uh, to because I know um, whatever resources may be helping you may uh, serve other practitioners and we hope to use the space as a resource and, and knowledge hub as well so uh, I would love to learn more from you on um, what the specific needs are and um, be able to use, again, our website as a platform for, for sharing and making those resources available. Oh, I think, Sarah, you're muted. Okay, great. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, another question that came in was about whether there's any financial resources for helping um, or whether EDF can sort of come to assist in local workshops or not, or what sort of financial resources might be available? Yeah, that's a great question. That is an excellent question. And I think um, th there's probably uh, a lot of different answers to this question. Um, at the minimum, the, the tools are intended to be uh, user-friendly and uh, off the shelf and um, perhaps with a little bit of engagement with uh, EDF colleagues or experts, we could um, work with you to assess um, what your needs are, help you identify uh, which tools could be um, applied uh, or, or serving the need that you have identified, and even have a light consultation on application of the tool or interpretation of the results. Um, the tool kit, again, is a, a living product, so um, we very much uh, believe in that ethos of continuous improvement. So there are opportunities for us to um, build out additional complementary resources, uh, including um, facilitation guides on how to apply and utilize the tool with partners. Uh, so more and more, we want to um, develop a set of ancillary resources and perhaps even trainings throughout the year that can support the goal of helping people um, find the tools they need and um, be empowered and equipped to be able to utilize the tools to serve their, their needs. Um, so in regards to the, the question about uh, local or, or funding to come in and, and do a workshop, I think it'll be based on a case by case um, uh, situation. Um, my understanding is we like don't have funding to do that, um, but um, should we be able to find funding together to support that? Um, that could be a possibility. Um, and without funding, there could be alternative models such as light consultations or even email exchanges. Uh, and again, um, something we look forward to is perhaps throughout the year, um, based on need and interests, um, offering and providing dedicated trainings, um, either through Octo or other platforms to help folks with the uh, adoption and application of tools. Okay, fantastic, Jeff. And I was going to ask you about the trainings later, so that's that's great. Um, okay, we had a, a question that came in in the chat. Um, it was said, "Awesome presentation, thank you." Has EDF ever explored adding scenario planning or forecasting to its tool list? If so, can you speak to that experience? Yes, yes. I think we've worked with some partners in in different regions to do uh, scenario planning, and um, 
I, I agree that that would actually be a really great uh, opportunity to develop new, new uh, tools or resources related to scenario planning. Um, embedded within some of our tools are like forms of scenario planning. So we do have um, some modeling related tools, um, management strategy evaluation tools. So looking at different outcomes of different management approaches. Um, but I think more formal um, scenario planning could be helpful, particularly in the context of climate change. Uh, so again, um, this is a, I'm so glad that uh, folks are um, asking these questions and providing these suggestions uh, in that, again, the toolkit um, is a, a living product. We only just launched, we made what was available. Um, our, we launched with what we we had and wanted to make what we had available to everyone, but um, we certainly hope to expand and build out the toolkit um, into the future. So um, for whoever asked that question, I'd love to uh, connect with you offline and uh, learn a little bit more about uh, your thoughts and see if there might be opportunities to guide and steer development of, of new tools on our site, um, perhaps even co-develop products uh, similar to what we've done with some other partners. Um, we, we also are very open to co-developing tools and products um, with, with external partners. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm going to combine two questions. I'm going to read them both. Um, the toolkit seems to be geared towards fisheries outside the US. Are there any case studies from the US using these tools? And we also got a question. Do you have any examples of your climate resilience tool being used in North American fisheries? What is the project with the longest timeline? And what were the results so far? Great. Yes. So uh, thank you for that question. And I wanted to clarify that the tool kit is meant to serve the global fisheries um, sector, so global fisheries practitioners, so that is inclusive of North America. And uh, we do have a lot of uh, case studies and examples from um, our work and, and work done by others in the United States to uh, develop uh, rights-based management programs. Um, in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Pacific, in Alaska, in the Northeast. Um, and we do have a set of resources uh, related to designing and implementing rights-based management that draw largely from the North America experience, um, um, include many case studies, um, and allow folks to design rights-based systems um, for a variety of contexts. So it could be for a more industrialized commercial fishery, um, or it could be for a more uh, community level, community oriented uh, fishery. Um, and then in regards to the second question about long standing tool application, I believe. Yes. That's so, right, yeah. yes, yes. So, um, I guess I'll go get a little bit philosophical. So, um, as, as you've seen, or as I've described, um, we have over 30 tools and products on our website. And um, when you like look at each tool and product um, beneath the surface, it is um, experience and engagement with um, multiple communities and places around the world. Uh, so I'll, I'll touch upon our fishy framework, which was part of the story I shared from Indonesia. Um, that is a framework that is geared towards helping um, folks, particularly in data limited fisheries, but it doesn't have to be a data limited fishery, um, develop a nice roadmap or pathway of integrating the whatever information or data that they have to be able to align it with uh, shared fishery goals, uh, indicators, um, and data collection, harvest control measures, and it really helps folks build a foundation for climate adaptive management. And that framework and tool came to be through iterations and uh, experiences working with communities in many places around the world, Mexico, Belize, uh, Indonesia, the Philippines. And each time we work with partners, we developed like the version 1.0 and then um, so, for example, maybe we started in, in Belize, uh, and then that same framework was brought to Indonesia, and the framework was expanded, involved, and adapted over time. And so 
it, it's really hard to kind of like dissect like um, tool um, and um, one particular particular place because many different experiences and many different um, places have shaped like the manifestation of what the tool, each tool is right now. Um, and they all, I see them as living products. So they will continue to evolve and adapt and the new tools will continue to enter based on, on regional needs. Um, but I think one longstanding application of uh, our tools has been, can be found in, in Belize um, with the, um, management there. Uh, they have a national uh, managed access program with clearly defined uh, fishing areas and uh, for lobster and conch. And we had worked with um, the fisheries department over the last decade to um, develop that system. And then now that system is being expanded upon to um, look at climate change threats to um, expand to more multi-species management. So um, the Belize experience um, has shaped the development of many of our tools. And then in parallel, many of our tools have been designed to serve the Belize context. Um, so I think one of the most kind of elegant examples are, is um, Belize. Like we've, it has been this kind of like symbiotic relationship of um, us supporting um, partners in Belize, developing tools, tools coming out of those experiences that then go um, serve, um, you know, other places, other geographies that we're working in. And then Belize would be on the next management question. And then we're able to continue working with them to develop a tool to, to serve that need and pulling in experiences from other places around the world. Um, so it's, it's, it's not as clear cut, but um, yeah, I just want to say that um, many geographies uh, are reflected in in the tools that we have have developed. Um, each tool has been developed out of the need from someone um, working in a geography, someone from a community who had some sort of management question. And again, the toolkit is just a culmination of all those experiences, all those questions um, um, in one place, intended to serve others who run into the same challenges, uh, who run, um, are, are facing similar challenges. And um, so with that, I see the toolkit again as this, this living being, a living, living product. Okay, thank you, Jeff, that's great. Um, I'll read a question from the chat, um, which came in, thanks for this great work. Have you done any work grappling with how to align biodiversity conservation initiatives like marine protected areas and our MPA networks and adaptive fisheries management, species focused? Do any of the tools help to support the understanding of how different management approaches can be aligned to support fisheries resilience in the context of a rapidly changing climate, such as dealing with mismatches in scale? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. There are a few few things in the that question, so I'll do my best to try to pick them apart. Um, the first is about alignment with other like biodiversity measures and uh, and NPAs, and so um, I see a lot of the tools and products um, that we offer. Um, they can work in parallel with NPAs and um, help folks better understand um, how to manage more of the uh, fishing fishing effort and. Um, and um, yeah, I think like MPAs are a very, very broad category of management that can mean a lot of different things. Uh, but in the cases where um, fishing could still uh, occur, uh, our tools and products really focus on how to best ensure fishing can occur in a way that is meeting the needs of the users, but also um, in a way that is sustainable and helping promote uh, resilience um, a great example of this is our, our work in, in Indonesia. We've been working um, with Conservation International in um, Western or Eastern Indonesia to um, find ways to integrate fisheries management uh, into like an existing network of, of MPAs. Um, the existing network of MPAs designate like fishing areas, but within the fishing areas, there aren't really strong management measures related to the fishing. Uh, so there's still the risk of um, species being depleted um, and so um, that particular case, an example of how the tools and products um, can 
work in parallel or in cohesion with other conservation or biodiversity measures such as uh, MPAs. Uh, what was the second part of the question again? Yeah, it was a, it's a long question. Um, do any of the tools help to support the understanding of how different management approaches ah, are designed yes. to support fisheries resilience in the context of a rapidly changing climate, um, such as dealing right. with mismatches in scale? Right, right. That's such a beautiful question and one that we are thinking about uh, a lot. Um, as I mentioned, one of our climate resilient fisheries pathways is to ensure that there's cooperation between boundaries. Um, we all know that fish don't know borders. And so um, this issue of scale or topic of scale is one that has um, been embedded in many of our tools. So in particular, a lot of our tools that look at the policy and governance landscapes, as well as like the biology of the resource, will try to assess and understand, okay, um, is a jurisdiction of management aligned with the scale of this resource, the scale of the stock? Um, are the resources and capacity to manage the stock aligned or, or adequate for this, this resource and the scale that it exists in? And uh, our, our tools are intended to help diagnose that. And, and, and oftentimes when we're working with partners to um, highlight that as potentially being uh, a threat to, to resilience, because um, if the scale is not appropriate, um, this can result in um, ineffective management or potential for, for conflict. So um, I'll start by saying that some of our tools, like the policy and governance analysis tool I described, um, help users explore that, and more importantly, help bring that uh, topic of scale uh, into the room into the conversation, uh, into the consciousness and awareness of um, folks who are, are working um, in the communities or uh, other stakeholders, um, and, and trying to highlight that as being uh, something that um, should be addressed and integrated into management. Um, beyond that, uh, we are hoping to develop a, a new suite of tools that help identify um, or help, help provide solutions or potential exploration of solutions for these different challenges. Um, so I think um, one particular area of interest for us is exploring um, allocation. And if um, certain uh, countries or um, fleets are allocated quota at the moment and the stocks are shifting, like how, how do we tackle that? And what, what are ways to navigate that difficult situation? Um, so there's um, interest from our end in exploring that dimension. Um, but again, like I think this is a topic that is ripe for continued conversation and dialogue. So whoever shared that question, I'd love for you to um, email me, get in touch, and we could think through kind of what the needs are together and, and maybe co-develop something. But um, I think this is a very, very important question um, given given climate change and shifting stocks and shifting distribution. Um, I think it's incredibly important. Um, yeah, it's it's like, it's, it's the thing that keeps me up at night, like um, the potential for increasing conflict due to um, improper scale and shifting scales um, with climate change. Okay, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, and the person who asked that said she would get in touch with you soon. Um, I want one last question. We just have one minute left. Um, you mentioned something about mapping fisheries ecosystems. Can you tell us more about this and perhaps how we might access this resource? Yes, mapping fishery ecosystems. So I'm not exactly sure, but I can describe some of the things that we we have. So um, we do have some tools that look at the health of the ecosystem. Um, one is called uh, CARE, the Comprehensive uh, ass um, Assessment of Risk to Ecosystems. Um, so that helps one look at um, if you are working in a fishery and you are ready to work on fisheries management, um, what are the other risks to the ecosystem that might um, thwart your efforts to build uh, sustainability in the fishery? Um, there could be a mine or there could be heavy pollution. And so um, trying to make sure and understand like all the different threats to the ecosystem that you're working in 
um, before you're actually working in um, fisheries. Um, this could guide uh, opportunities to work further upstream or with other agencies to ensure that the ecosystem at large can, can be healthy. Um, so that's an example of um, one quick one. Um, and uh, yeah, if there are any additional questions, definitely feel free to uh, email me. I'm happy to respond. I know we're running short on time. Okay, thank you. There were a couple more questions. Sarah, I I believe responded to one of them, but actually, Mark, thank you for sending that in. Actually, I'll look into uh, getting a webinar on on Ditto. That looks fascinating. Um, okay, Jeff, thank you so much. We we I mean, great presentation and uh, like great answers to the questions. And we appreciate you guys doing this and your willingness to work with others in the fisheries community to help uh, address their needs um, as they go forward with their management. And thank you to everyone who is here. Um, you, you've got uh, Jeff's contact information and the web link to the toolkit. And um, we appreciate you being here. And um, we hope to see you on our future webinars. Hopefully we can have the EDF folks back on again to talk about the new functionality for the toolkit once it's ready. So thank you, everybody. It's been such a pleasure. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And, and thank you, everyone. And have a great rest of your day.